I've been in the field for nearly 20 years now, and much of that has been in individual giving, um, grant writing, um, and really kind of strategic planning and development services. The reason I can talk today about donor advised funds began about 14 years ago when I was at Lincoln Park Zoo here in Chicago and I received my first check from Fidelity and had no idea what it was. That led me down a rabbit hole and I've really been fascinated by donor advised funds since then. Um, I've continued to research them, I've presented on them frequently, and have helped set up policies and procedures within development offices to capitalize on this trend in philanthropy. So today, we have a pretty aggressive agenda, and I know we started a little bit late, so I'm going to try to move us along um, so that we can get to the end. That is really the critical part, the implementation. But first, we're going to start with an introduction just to what are donor advised funds, talk a little bit about how they're administered, who oversees them, what are the nuts and bolts of how they work. I want to make sure I equip you with some legal and ethical resources to help you understand how donor advised funds are different from your other types of donors, different than individual individuals, different than foundations or corporate giving. And then like I said, we really want to get into a bit more of a conversation where we talk about how you can use this information to benefit your organization. As Lily said, jump in anytime in the chat box or raise your hand. I wish we were sitting around a table or at a coffee shop and we could dialogue more, um, but we're going to use this platform as much as possible to get your specific questions answered. I also just want to share that I have had many conversations both with donor advised fund holders um, so those donors that implement them, as well as these sponsors or administrators. And so a lot of this is informed by conversations with those folks. And so throughout this time, I'll try to share those stories so that you're really hearing from those who both administer them as well as use them uh, to give you as much understanding as possible. Why are we having this conversation? I'm guessing you are aware that donor advised funds are the fastest growing philanthropic vehicle right now. Last year, over 19 billion was distributed through DAS. I'm guessing you want to know how your organization can be a part of that. Um, this fall, we are actually had some other reports come out that said that the first six months of 2019 uh, showed even more increase in DAF giving. Um, you'll see there, just examples of Fidelity and Schwab both had significant increases even in the first six months of the year, which we weren't quite sure what to expect, frankly. Um, so much giving comes usually at the end of the calendar year that seeing this increase even in the first six months of the year is a really interesting trend. Just to add a little more context, during the last eight years, DAFs grew from just 4.5% to over 10% of all individual giving. So they've more than doubled their place within the individual giving realm. And the number of individuals that are using DAFs has increased by more than 200%. So we're seeing that this is really a growing uh, trend, especially because it is attracting a broad base of individuals not only those high net worth donors, but also more middle class or um, you know, kind of a standard average income family as well. In the last year of the top 10 nonprofits in the country who have received the most donations, who have raised the most funds, five of the 10 of those are actually DAF sponsors. So again, that tells you that, you know, five are organizations like Red Cross or, you know, nonprofits working on the front line. But the other half of those are ones that are redistributing the money through donor advised funds. So we really want to understand this trend, which leads to the next point. We all want to steward our donors well. And if we don't understand how donor advised funds works or who's using them, we can't steward them and continue to have them be a part of uh, our mission and join in the important work that we're doing. Finally, we're talking about them because DAFs raise a lot of questions, right? I'm sure you have questions and I hope again, you'll use the chat box to share some of those. 
there's been a lot of debate in the sector. Are DAFs good or bad? You know, are people just using them as like a holding fund and they're putting money in there, but then not distributing them? Or how do I find out about DAFs or their administrators? Uh, I'm really excited to, you know, get more DAF gifts for my organization, but I don't know where to do that. And a lot of people wonder where are the funds going? Uh, there's not the same type of uh, reporting and transparency that perhaps foundations or corporate giving programs have. So we wonder what happens to these funds that have gone into donor advised funds? What kinds of organizations are benefiting? And we're going to delve into all of those in greater detail today. But as Maria says, we should start at the very beginning. You might be surprised to hear that donor advised funds are actually, they have a long rich history. Um, we think that they're a new vehicle, but they've simply gained popularity in the last few years. Uh, the New York Community Trust set up the first DAF back in 1930. And I am a historian in my first career, so I could get really excited going through all of this, but I'm just gonna focus on a few high points uh, that are important for you to understand because it affects how you can steward donor advised fund donors. There are restrictions on them that are different than individual giving. And that's what I really wanna highlight in some of this history. Um, so in the 60s, they started to really establish the actual format and structure of what a DAF could be. Then there was a lot of debate and frustration, as I expressed earlier, people fearing that this was just becoming a repository for money and it wasn't actually turning into philanthropy. People weren't distributing it. So that, that um, act in uh, 2006 was really putting some restrictions on how DAFs could be used um, in order to counter that fear that the money was just um, sitting in a pot somewhere growing, 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 but not achieving its purpose. And, um, and then I'm sure you heard, uh, you know, about 2016 is when they really took off and then the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. It went into effect in December, and that's when the standard IRS deduction for individuals changed, and there was now an immediate benefit for individuals to make a gift to a donor-advised fund rather than individual gifts to organizations. We'll get into that more in a minute as we talk about motivation, but that's when these really exploded, and um, became such a significant vehicle that we, we need to take time and, and look into them more deeply. Just to make sure we're all on the same page, I do want to take a moment to read the definition. Um, this is how the IRS defines a DAF. It's a philanthropic vehicle established at a public charity, so it can only be housed by a public charity. It can't be by a bank or just a regular nonprofit. It allows donors to make a charitable contribution, receive an immediate tax benefit, and then recommend grants from the fund over time. So that's the really important part here, that you make the gift now and you can, the initial gift to begin the DAF, but then you can make distributions over time. I also want to point out that it's a donor advised fund. Technically, the donor does not have sole um, control over the fund. It is controlled by the advisor or the sponsor. In reality, there are very few instances where the sponsor or advisor would not follow the donor intent. So a donor says, please make a gift of $500 to organization X, $10,000 to organization Y, and half a million to organization Z. In all likelihood, the sponsor would follow those donor wishes, but there are times where due to their research, due to ethical issues, they might say no. And so I just want to bring that up, that technically um, they are simply advising, and that's the language that you should use as you interact with these donors. What's also important here is just to remember that these donors are unique in that they are prioritizing their philanthropic giving and placing it into a DAF. We're going to talk about that donor motivation more, 
but it's a very important clue. If someone has set up a DAF, they are a very strategic, important type of donor for you to cultivate and know. Let's get a little bit into the nuts and bolts of how DAFs work. We've already talked about this a little, and I'm sure some of you know this and have experience, but I, again, I wanna make sure we're all on the same page as we delve more deeply. So the donor makes an additional gift. It can be cash, it can be appreciated securities. Um, some sponsors I've talked to, they'll even take gifts of real estate or boats or things like that. It may not be their favorite because they have some work to do then to um, sell it and, and get it into a, a cash form. But the donor can make a variety of types of gifts and then set up their donor advised fund. They name their account. It's often a family name, like a family foundation, but they can name it after their dog or any other name that they choose. And then like that charity um, bank account, it is invested. It grows over time. And they have investment managers who are looking to steward those funds and make sure they're invested wisely. The great thing for the donor is that they get the immediate tax benefit. The moment they put the money into the DAF, they get the write-off. So this is wonderful if um, you want to maximize your tax benefits in one year and then have the ability over time to think about where you will make your strategic gifts. Um, Let's talk a little bit about who is administering these. I've used that word a lot, administrator or sponsor. They're used interchangeably. And they're grouped by the sector into these three buckets, for lack of a better term, community foundations, national charities, and single issue charities. Community foundations uh, are a natural player in this. They already know the needs of the community. They're often familiar with the nonprofits working on the front lines, and they have existing relationships with donors. As you saw, the very first donor advised fund was set up at a community foundation in 1930, and they've continued to be a great asset. They really play the role of connecting nonprofits with donor advised funds um, so that they can achieve a desired impact together. National charities are actually where the largest number of donor advised funds and the greatest assets in donor advised funds currently reside. So these are things like Fidelity and Schwab, which you've probably heard the most about. Um, what you'll want to note is there's actually a separate you know, charitable fund then that's set up at Fidelity because of course Fidelity is not um, a nonprofit and in order to um, distribute DAF funds, you have to have this de designation of public charity. And so they apply and have a separate section that is a public charity and then therefore can administer these funds. Because of their growing popularity, um, some other uh, different types of institutions have gotten into uh, the, the donor advised fund realm as well. Jewish federations were one of the first to do that. They're located across the country. I know the one here in Chicago has an active portfolio of thousands of DAFs that they administer, but as do their offices all across the country. More recently, other entities like universities and hospitals have started to dabble in DAFs. This gives them a great advantage with their existing donors. They have a chance to keep those donors close and provide a service for them. If a major donor is already committed to the work that the university is doing, it might be a natural fit to set up a DAF there that then the university can help them make decisions of how to allocate their funds to university causes as well as to other nonprofits. I will note some of these have specific criteria. For instance, the Jewish Federation may say that you know, all gifts or a certain portion of the gifts must be to Jewish friendly causes. For instance, they're not going to give to organizations that are anti-Semitic. Anti um, a university might require that a certain amount of the DAF funds come back to the university through gifts. Um, in return for the services they're providing in investing those funds and stewarding them in other ways. So I know this is a lot of information. Um, we are starting to get into um, 
kind of some of the trends now about how we should think about this. Remember, Lily shared that this slide deck will also be sent after the presentation. So don't feel like you need to rush and jot down all of these numbers. This is the big, big picture, and this is why you can go back to your office and say, we need to pay attention to donor advised funds. Uh, let me just acclimate you to this chart a little bit. That first column echoes the buckets that we just talked about, national charities, community foundations, and single issue charities. It also has a number in parenthesis. That is the number of organizations of that type that the National Philanthropic Trust included in this assessment. So as you'll see at the bottom of the screen, I have the source listed. And so they tried to pull every single donor advised administrator and sponsor in the country. And this is how many they were able to reach through this survey. And that's where all this information comes from. So what do we see from this besides a lot of big numbers and plus signs? Um, the takeaway here is, the number of DAF accounts is growing. The amount of assets in those DAFs is growing. And the number of grants distributed from them is growing. So these are not holding pots for money. These are very active donors who are regularly making gifts to the causes that are important to them. I think it's also interesting to look at that last column, the average DAF size. These are not multi-million dollar funds like family foundations typically are. These are much smaller. And there are certainly some that are multi-million. And in fact, many family foundations are choosing to move their funds from their family foundation into a DAF because it's easier for them. And we'll talk about that more later. But what I want you to understand is the type of donor here that you're most likely to be interacting with through donor advised funds. Um, these are smaller um, pots of money. Um, these are more um, middle class individuals. It's often a family where multiple generations may be contributing to it. Um, and that's what's so great about the AS is they're much more accessible than setting up a, a family foundation for those that are committed to their philanthropic work, but don't have the assets that justify setting up a separate foundation. So let me get into just uh, a few more trends to help you understand where we're at. This was contained in the previous chart, but I think it's just much more clear here. Within the last five years, the assets in donor advised funds has nearly doubled. This is important to know. And note that these numbers are in billions. So this is a really um, significant amount of money that is being stewarded and then distributed in this way. Similarly, the grants from DAFs have nearly doubled in the last five years. Um, as you know, foundations are only required to give 5% of their assets every year. What we actually find with donor advised funds, most donors are giving approximately 20% of their assets every year. So these are actually much more of a um, a source of funding that there's a quicker flow through that people are using rather than using to retain their um, their assets. Where's the money going? This is what you all pay for. This is what you want to know. What we find is that DAF recipients are very similar to overall individual giving trends. I'm sure you follow Giving USA every year and are familiar with their reports about where uh, gifts are going throughout our country. And what we find is that individuals, whether they're giving through a DAF or giving cash assets, other gifts, are giving to similar types of organizations. As you'll see here, most of it goes to education, religion, public society benefit, which is kind of a broad uh, area, including some democracy and justice initiatives. Um, it also includes veterans, uh, some things like that, and then human services. So this very much aligns with all individual giving trends. There are a few differences. Just about two weeks ago, the Gates Foundation came out with a report saying their analysis of DAF giving shows that they're slightly skewed towards 
women and girl issues and programs, which I found fascinating. They're going to continue to monitor that trend, but found that um, more donor advised fund owners are uh, interested in giving to girls and women rather than your average population. How did DAF spit into the big picture of all of philanthropic giving? So this kind of, again, gets with back to that Giving USA report where we know individuals are usually 70 to 80% of all philanthropic giving and then corporate and foundation are a much smaller piece of the pie. So this helps you see just visually where the assets lie. Although private foundations certainly have much more money in them than DAFs, it's still true that DAFs are giving a higher percentage every year than private foundations. And of course, individuals will continue to be the most significant source of funds. Let me take a breath and summarize a little bit. These are mostly things we've already covered with a few additional um, nuggets of information. And then we're gonna pause for some questions here. So we can all agree DAFs are growing quickly. And it's largely because they're attractive to a wider variety of donors. They're not just for the high net worth individuals. They are for a wide variety. It's for middle class folks. It's for extended families. Um, most DAFs only require an initial deposit of five or $10,000 to open the account. So again, that's really accessible for most people. Uh, it's not like a family foundation where you really need several million to justify the process of incorporating and all the administrative expense of, of setting up that entity. Also, as we just saw, DAS are held by a relatively few number of sponsors. In fact, to get even a finer point on it, 15 organizations total, 15, so like Fidelity and the National Philanthropic Trust, 15 organizations hold nearly 60% of all DAF assets in the entire country. So these are very um, um, specialized and grouped with a few entities that are truly experts in it. Although universities and hospitals and others are starting to be more active in this, it's largely a few major players in this space at this point. As we just said, the giving trends very much align with general philanthropic giving, education, religion, you know, kind of that benefit to society are where most DAF funds um, are distributed. And then I also want to add that granting patterns from these DAFs are relatively stable every year. There was some thought early on that, you know, people would again hoard or kind of bunch their giving, um, but we see that this, the giving each year remains relatively stable both within each individual fund but also aggregate um, you know so DAS as a whole um, also that they do align with these granting patterns of high net worth donors both institutional you know grants as well as individual giving so I want to pause just for a moment and check in with Lily Lily do we have any questions yet um, or if anyone has a question that has come to mind as I've been rambling, um, please jump in, raise your hand so we can unmute you or submit a question via uh, the chat box. I'm not seeing anything yet in the chat box. Um, I am just going through and unmuting. So if anybody, do, oh, I think I am, if anybody does <laughs> want to um, speak up, they can. Right. Okay. Quiet but happy crowd, I'm hoping. <laughs> I think so. I'll keep an eye. Oh, I've got one. Um, the DAF sponsor holds the funds only or also invests? This is they from hold Sanaya. and invest. That's a great question. Yes, yeah, so they're investing them. So it is, um, and that's one of the reasons people were concerned that there weren't ample distributions from them because if they're investing well, DAFs could grow rapidly. And so part of the service and the reason why people choose DAFs, which is what we'll get into in a moment, 
is because you have these talented investors then who are helping make wise decisions for you. And if they're investing well, then you really can expand your philanthropic impact and um, continue to make larger gifts. So that is a great uh, clarification. I'm glad you asked. Anything else, Lily? Um, Sanaya has added, so if an organization currently holds an endowment, is there an opportunity to transfer to a DAF? Ah, that is a fantastic question. We might need to pull in a legal expert here. I think that, because the purpose of a DAF is to grant out and I'm not sure if you're just, you know, granting out to yourself in essence, if that um, is allowable. I do, I can ask um, one of the, the experts that I have learned from is Bob Eichinger at the Chicago Community Trust and also um, Rose Jagist here at the Chicago office of the Jewish Federation. Um, and so I can certainly clarify with them. I'm not as familiar as the differences between endowments and DAS as I am with family foundations and DAFs, but I will follow up on that. She added, um, so the scholarship recipients, yes. So the scholarship recipients would be the grantees. So I, I'm gonna try and unmute you. Um, so you could just talk freely. It might be a little easier to get your clarifying questions. I don't know if it's working. <laughs> Are you there, Sanea? Are you able to ask? She said she doesn't have a microphone. Okay. okay. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. And I think I know what you're getting at. And I'm not sure because you're then distributing to individuals rather than to a nonprofit entity. DAFs, the distribution needs to be to a 501c3. Um, so again, if you're writing the checks from your organization, um, to a 501c3 that's a university for a scholarship, then you might be able to, but I'd like to explore that a little more in depth and I'll include some of those answers in the follow-up materials that we send after this webinar. She added money would go to the universities. Yeah, so okay. I think that might be where you get a bit of leeway but I'd like to explore that a little bit more with Bob and just make sure it's nice to have these attorneys to ask because they uh, can make sure I'm not misspeaking. And I mean, none of us look good in orange, right? So I don't want to end up in prison, nor you. Right. Um, all right. Well, we're getting into the really important part, which I hope is where you feel empowered and can go back to your offices and apply this. So I'm going to jump right in. We need to understand the owner motivation. You know, why? These vehicles have existed. Donor advised funds have been around for nearly 90 years. Why are they suddenly exploding now? And how then do we channel some of that enthusiasm, those funds that have been restricted for a philanthropic purpose? How do we understand those donors so that we can connect with them and steward them well? There are some really specific benefits to donor advised funds. There are many more than these, but these are the ones that I have heard um, from my sources as well as are often you know, reported when um, advisors report back on why people choose donor advised funds. We've already talked about the tax benefits, that the moment you put the money in, you get the benefits, so you don't have to wait. There's also the flexibility and convenience then. So, um, I'm thinking specifically, you know, maybe Grandma Mary passes away. You get an extensive amount of money, um, but you don't know what to do with it. You've got estate taxes to pay. You're trying to close her estate. A DAF is a wonderful resource because you can put the money in, immediately get that tax deduction, but then you have as much time as you need to think about what would honor Grandma Mary? Where, do, where would she want me to make gifts over time? Um, and you have that flexibility of convenience of calling up an, an advisor who can help you with that, who can guide you. Um, one of the things we haven't really talked about yet is their role in connecting and be, being a matchmaker for organizations and donors. Um, so for instance, Bob and Rose both talk about, you know, they see their role as getting to know all of the, um, or as many as possible, of course, uh, 
kind of key issues within their geographic region and trying to see who are the big players, who are the nonprofits that are addressing these problems. Because what often happens is a donor will come in and say, I've got this donor advised fund. Maybe I've been really focused on arts for the last few years. But as I read in the paper about the violence in our city, I want to do something about that. And this advisor then does the research. They do the due diligence of saying, here are some organizations doing this work. Do you want me to set up appointments with any of them? Do you want me to get their annual reports? Do you want to learn about what they're doing? Um, and this, of course, you know, helps a donor really achieve their desired impact and their strategy for um, their philanthropic giving. So I think that is something that can't be um, understated the role of an advisor as well as as we talked about the investment aspect so they don't have to manage and invest the funds themselves and they have someone help make sure that they're having the greatest possible impact in their giving um, it's got very low administrative fees and as we said low um, minimum requirement to open the account um, Often it's based on a, the administrative fees are a percentage of your total assets in the fund. And often it's like half a percent or, you know, 1% for the first you know, million dollars and then, you know, a quarter percent for every million after that or something. But it's really very low considering all the services that you receive as the advisor and the investment and just the distribution, the convenience, you know, one tax record, you get all of your you know, receipts um, nicely compiled, which really helps. So all of those are great benefits. And then, as I alluded to, this intergenerational philanthropy, a DAF owner can um, suggest their account successor or charitable beneficiaries. So if I had an extra $10,000 and I set up a DAF, I could choose to say that my children will be the owners of it upon my passing. Or I could choose to say, upon my passing, distribute, you know, half to this organization and half to that organization. And remember, those assets are going to keep growing if they're invested well. So if they're invested well, my children may have a, a philanthropic vehicle they could use for most of their adult lives. Um, and so there's really a, a, a sense here where families are looking for ways to be connected together and make choices that um, are very strategic and this gives them the flexibility and the vehicle to do that above all when we talk about benefits to donors we need to talk about impact whether it's an institution you know such as a foundation or a corporate giving program um, or an individual everyone is motivated by their desire for a specific impact and DAFs in particular are a clue that this person, this family, has a specific impact in mind, that they are thinking very strategically about their giving. And so we want to be mindful of that. Um, and we're going to talk about throughout the donor cycle how to ask those questions and how to understand what their desired impact is so that they'll consider your organization to be a recipient for their DAF funds. Kristen? Yes. We had a question come in from Magda. Um, how can nonprofits access and influence an advisor? Excellent. We are getting into that. That's a perfect segue. This is where this actually kind of looks like my grandma Martha. It's funny. Um, what do we do with this? How do we take advantage of that? Um, and I think you know what you're getting at is this difference here of DAFs and foundations that Foundations, you know, are searchable and you know who your program officer is and you can cultivate them or at least confirm, you know, kind of qualify and see if you are in fact a fit for them. Um, so let me just touch on these other um, few differences and then we're exactly going to get into your question, Magda. Um, so you're probably well aware of these other differences because foundations for most organizations are much more comfortable. We've worked with them for a long time. We know how they function, but DAFs are distinctly different. Um, although they're often bucketed uh, in nonprofit staffs and overseen, those gifts are often processed by grant individuals, grant managers. And so that's why we want to just clarify the differences. So generally, DAFs do not receive requests or proposals. 
Um, as we've said, there's no minimum annual distribution requirement, so they don't have to give out like foundations do. We can't find them. There's no FDO or grant station or all these other tools um, like we have for foundations. There's not one for DAFs. And frankly, that's actually a benefit that we didn't talk about. A lot of donor advised funds like the anonymity. They like the fact that you cannot search them on FDO and solicit them. Um, it gives them uh, more of that privacy to make the decisions that they want. Does that mean that they're un, you know, you were unable to find them? No, and we're gonna talk about how we do that. Um, and I also wanna to touch on this last one for a moment, because this is essential and so important for your policies and procedures. And again, to make sure that there's no legal um, issues. DAFs cannot receive donor benefits um, and it is very strict. So this is different. Some foundations, you're probably less likely to give benefits to foundations, but certainly individuals. And again, I'll go back to my example of working at Lincoln Park Zoo. We often had people give through donor advised funds for you know, $5,000 a year, $10,000 a year. And for us, that was a specific giving level. And with that giving level came certain benefits, you know, tickets to the gala, behind the scenes tours, maybe a little mug, um, you know, other perks um, associated with their gift, which for us were really important because we wanted to steward them well and keep them connected and show them the impact. A DAF cannot receive any of those. If there's any value, they cannot receive it. Um, and the reason is, remember, they got their tax benefit when they made the initial gift into their donor advised fund. So they may have made a gift back in 2002, but they're just now distributing a gift to you in 2019. They can't double, you know, take two sets of benefits for that. And so if they were to take that, you know, from that $10,000, technically you you know, subtract the amount, the value of their gift, and then it's the remainder that is tax deductible. Um, and so that's why they cannot receive any benefits. And that's so important to have all of your staff know and make sure that you are following that, especially as you think about things like gala tickets where you might want to comp them, but they absolutely cannot um, receive those. I promise, Magda, we're here now. We're going to talk about, if you can't, you know, look them up, in a way like foundations, how then do we um, identify them? How do we you know, qualify and cultivate them? I hope you're all familiar with the donor cycle. This holds true for all types of donors, whether it's an institution or an individual, and it's certainly applicable for the donor advised fund. What you need to think about in all of this, the lens is that donor advised funds are really individual gifts. It's just the vehicle that they're using. Just like you don't try to identify and qualify and cultivate credit card donors and ignore check donors, same thing. You're not going to be looking for DAF donors rather than another type of donors. It's just the way in which they make the gift. So that's really helpful throughout this to think about, we are cultivating, we are developing relationships, we are stewarding and doing moves management for individuals. And the individuals just happen to have a donor advised fund. So in the ID process, in the identification process, I've asked a variety of sponsors and administrators this exact question because inquiring minds want to know. And indeed, most of them are open to receiving, for instance, a one page summary of your organization. Um, Bob and Rose both said um, that they um, often get those. Um, and it, hopefully it starts organically and, you know, not in a stalker-esque way. Um, often people will come up to them at an event, you know, especially a community event. Um, it might be just a, you know, one-page letter that they send, but you can indeed introduce your organization to these sponsors and administrators of DAFs, and then they can help you identify DAFs that might be a match. So you can't look them up anywhere, but you can work on having a relationship with those people who have access to those, that pool of donors. You can also do some detective work. Again, depending on how much time you have in your staff capacity. I know some organizations that actually look through 
you know, the annual reports of other similar organizations and have found quite a few donor advised funds that way. Often you'll see, you know, it's the so-and-so family fund, which is usually a tip. Um, again, they can name it anything they want, so it's not always helpful, but that is something that might work. Some community foundations will actually list on their website or in their annual report, they will list all the donor advised funds. Um, it, again, it depends on the entity. If it's something like Fidelity, we're out of luck. You know, they're not going to help us. Their um, purpose is to you know, keep their client happy. And certainly, you know, the onus is on them to research the nonprofits and make sure that they're ethical and wise distributions. But they don't have that level of commitment to the community. But on the other hand, if it is like a community foundation or Jewish federation, their commitment is to the community and they are very open to learning about you because they want to match their donors with the types of organizations that the donor is interested in so that the donor has their desired impact. So as you're thinking about, you know, the qualification and cultivation, it may in fact include a little bit of cultivation of a, an administrator or a um, sponsor. But more importantly, you should be qual qualifying and cultivating your individual donors. Again, you may not know if they have a donor advised fund or if they're just going to write you a check, but the process needs to be the same and you should go ahead and have that moves management in place so that you are moving them around this circle. What might be different both in cultivation and in solicitation is your language. That's something we want to talk about. Does your website currently talk about how you accept gifts from donor advised funds? Um, are you prepared to ask a donor if they would like to make a gift through their donor advised fund? Perhaps even on your response device, you'll want to include some language about donor advised funds. Again, it depends on your organization. I've seen that more often in capital campaigns or larger efforts. You know, most annual fund donors are probably not going to give through a DAF. They're probably just going to write a check. Um, but again, it, you need to feel confident and have those options available. Um, some big organizations, I'm thinking like St. Jude's and some universities, actually on their giving page have a link where you can directly um, say, I want to make a gift from Fidelity or from Schwab, and you can click on it and it will take you directly to your DAF login, and then you can seamlessly make that gift online. Most of us are small organizations, we don't have the ability to do that. But again, you need to be prepared to have that conversation with them. And so if they say, I have a donor advised fund, A, your little you know, antenna goes up saying, this means they're really strategic, this means that they're invested in the community, that they're trying to um, be careful and they wanna measure impact. But also it helps you then understand how to go about um, making the ask and help you understand that there is some processing time then as it goes to the administrator or sponsor. Um, as far as stewardship, and I'm, I know I'm hurrying because I'm mindful of time and I do wanna make sure we ask, have time for a few more questions here at the end. Stewardship, again, the big thing is yes, acknowledge them, send them that thank you, but the acknowledgement cannot have any language about tax benefits. You cannot say that this gift is benefit or is um, is um, deductible to the extent allowed by law or whatever. You need to have a separate version, a separate template of that acknowledgement letter so that they are not able to write it off twice. This is really important. Um, but you should continue to steward them in every way possible. Send them impact reports, you know, ask them out to coffee, all of these things that have no value associated. Again, no gala tickets, no other fancy perks, but you can steward them as you would other major donors. Um, okay, I think I have shared much of this already um, and I'm trying to hurry for a few additional questions. So again, some of those takeaways is just to make sure that you've got the DAF language everywhere that shows those donors that you are able to respond if that is their preferred vehicle. You want to make sure you have really clear gift acceptance policies, especially with those um, legal aspects of no benefits. Um, and yes, to Magda's question, you know, if it's appropriate, if there is a way for you to have that conversation with your local community foundations, 
um, you know, from time to time, I have heard of people who had connections at Fidelity or Schwab, and they were able to have a conversation there as well. A little more difficult and is a more national focus in the giving, so it's not always as productive as a community foundation or a JUF where they're more focused on community giving. Um, and then really, above all, focus on cultivating that individual well. Move them through your moves management process and then just wait and see what giving vehicle they choose to use. I'm going to take a breath. I've been talking fast and a lot. I'm sure you still have questions. Lily, have any come in through uh, the chat box or does anyone want to raise their hand and ask questions? I don't see any questions yet on the chat box, but we'll give everyone just a moment. It gives me a second to get a sip of coffee. <laughs> Let me see if anybody's got their hands raised. While you're looking, I'll also just make a point too that um, in addition to several family foundations that I've worked with moving their funds to donor advised funds, there are also examples now of corporate giving programs or corporate foundations that have also moved their funds to a DAF. Again, for the same reasons, it's just so much more cost effective to administer, it's much easier. So don't be surprised if you see some of your other current funders changing the vehicle through which they give. And so again, you're just going to want to note that in your CRM, you're going to want to keep track of that so that you're acknowledging them properly and stewarding them properly um, you know, through that, um, regardless of what type of entity they are. All right, if there's no questions, I wanted to just let you know, um, as I send this out, there's this resource list as well with live links. Um, there's so much great information out there about donor advised funds. I hope that you have gotten a good introduction to it, understand a little more of the nuts and bolts of how they work, um, and also feel a little more equipped to have those conversations with donors. Um, one more just tidbit I'll throw in as we wrap up. This is also a great way you can serve your donors. You might notice um, that a donor wants to make a gift of real estate or yeah, a car or a boat or something that you as a small nonprofit don't have the ability to accept. You just don't have the bandwidth to try to then sell the property or deal with all the legal ramifications. This can actually be a time when you add value and are the advisor for your donor and might say a donor advised fund would be a really great vehicle for you because they have the capacity to sell it or you know, do whatever is involved in their type of gift. And then you can still make a gift back to us. Um, and that can be something that you can really help because a lot of donors still have, um, you know, believe myths about them, think the donor advised funds are for the filthy rich or that they're really difficult or don't know where to begin. So this can even be a way that you're stewarding your current donors and, and alerting them to an opportunity that might in fact strengthen your relationship with them over time by helping them um, understand that there's vehicles um, that would uh, further their own uh, philanthropic goals. Uh, if there are no additional questions, I just want to say thank you so much. I am delighted that we've had a chance to spend a little bit of time together. Please don't hesitate to reach out with follow-up questions. Um, I find DAFs fascinating and would be happy to dialogue with you or connect you with others in the field who are administrators and sponsors who can answer even more detailed questions. And a big thank you to Lily and Forefront for this opportunity. Um, Lily, any housekeeping as we close up or any final questions that have come through? Um, oh, we did get another question. Would that also work with a retirement benefit? I assume maybe that's in response to the question about um, if somebody comes with like a gift of property or a large asset. 
Yeah, so I'm assuming if it's like a large payout of some sort, certainly. Um, it depends to me. So this should definitely be part of your planned giving conversation with major donors. And they may, if, if you're getting at some of those type of, there are some retirement benefits that, you know, you can have distributions to a nonprofit at certain points. There are others where you can you know, set up annuities. Um, but yes, this should be part of that conversation where you are then talking to your donor and aware of the different options that might help them achieve their long-term goals. Um, did you, whoever said that, do you want to clarify any more? Um, hopefully that helped answer um, the intent of that question. Uh, she said, nope, that helps. <laughs> Great. Excellent. Excellent. So Lily and I will send out the slides so you have them. Um, I hope that you feel like you can now um, engage in this conversation in your offices and with your donors and um, really be on top of this donor advised um, fund trend and able to uh, maximize those types of gifts to your organization. All right, thank you everyone. Um, it may take a day or two before you get the response, so just be on the lookout for that. We're going to upload um, the recorded webinar into our LibGuide so that if you lose the email or you um, want to share it with somebody else, they can find it on our website as well. Um, so be on the lookout for that email in the next um, day or so. Thank you all for joining us and thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, you too.